Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you, Sibongale, for, for the, uh, the nice introduction. Um, I want to begin by, by thanking Lucia and the LC South Africa branch for the opportunity to join you today and share some thoughts. And, and I want to say before I start that the thoughts are my thoughts. So I'm not speaking for LC Europe, um, even though I've got some LC Europe background to share with you, uh, and, and not, not speaking for, for Nestle. So they're, they're purely my thoughts alone. So the challenge I think we have is to re-examine food, food safety and nutrition in the context of, of the current nexus between the environment, land, water, food, diet, and um, limited uh, resources, also, of course, um, complicated by the phenomenon of climate change. So I'm going to structure my talk, talk as follows. Uh, building on what Dudu has already said, I, I want to share with you some thoughts about what we do in ILSI Europe, the work we do, and, and maybe a few thoughts as well about um, ILSI worldwide, because I think <coughs> it is a powerful organization with, with a very small um, real base resource, but because of the networks and because of its global reach, manages to achieve a, a great deal. Um, some thoughts about the changing reality uh, leading into, of course, what we now live in. We live in the Anthropocene, which is the currently recognized <coughs> geological era brought about by humankind's activities on the planet. Um, some thoughts about the advancing sciences that are going to change everything about the way we live, societal advances and demands, and then the opportunities, the real key takeaway messages. What can we do about all of that? So ILSI, you've already heard a little bit about ILSI. It's 40 years old next year, founded in 1978 um, in, in Washington, D.C. The ILSI Europe branch is now 31 years old, and the other branch is, is HESI, which is, which is 25 years old. Um, looking at, 26, at, at 2016, um, I think there was a remarkable number of achievements. This is just one slide summarizing what happened in the world of ILSI globally in 2016. So 119 different publications peer-reviewed in the scientific literature. 300 workshops and conferences. The um, meeting which was previously called Beseto, Beseto means a, a, a manual meeting between the uh, Beijing branch, the Seoul branch, and the Tokyo branch of ILSI. Now it includes Taiwan as well. So I'm, I'm not sure what they will call it in future, Besoto Tai, maybe. <laughs> but, but again, it's, it's a collaboration in, in that Asian region on harmonization of regulations, on sharing know-how, risk assessment, nutrition assessment, etc. HESI, the Health and Environmental Sciences Institute, which is one of the 18 branches of ILSI worldwide, um, have a project <coughs> called Thrive. And Thrive was named in 2016 one of the US White House moonshot participants. And they do all that with 90 staff, 9-0. So not a huge resource to do all the work that is actually achieved. And then um, three other achievements I wanted to highlight. Uh, one was the, the major international food packaging symposium run every four years by ILSI Europe. And there were 300 plus participants at that. And it is the only conference of its kind in the world because it brings packaging expertise together with safety expertise, material science expertise, analytical expertise, etc., etc. No other gathering on packaging can, can actually achieve that. And I want to emphasize for food and packaging, you've got a lot of similarity there. You've got a lot of complexity. You've got know-how in the private sector and you've got know-how in the public sector. 
And that, that know-how must come together to solve the problems. That's what it's all about. No one part can fix the problems by themselves. Then uh, there was the uh, seventh Asian conference on food safety and nutrition, which is uh, launched by the Ilse Southeast Asia branch. And then finally, uh, Judezila has already mentioned that uh, you had the MRA course in Ilse South Africa. And, and this was regarded as a milestone internationally as well, that, that it's, it's recognized outside of Africa as a major contribution to advancing science of microbial risk assessment. So in Europe, um, the, this is our vision. We build a multi-stakeholder science-based solutions for a sustainable and healthier world. And our mission then, we have four elements of our mission. One is fostering collaboration between relevant stakeholders. That's what it's all about, bringing the stakeholders together to solve the problems. We, we identify existing and emerging challenges in food, nutrition, and health, and facilitate proactive, practical solutions. All of that is not much use if it cannot be communicated and disseminated and put to use. So we communicate and disseminate our output as widely as possible. That happens through the conferences and workshops. And most importantly, and um, Zila mentioned this, that our way of working as well <coughs> is extremely important to us. It's designed to deliver science of the highest quality and integrity. That means multipartite participation. It means transparency. And it means peer review publications in respected journals. Because without that, uh, the discussions and, 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 and talking is of little value. So looking at the bigger picture in Europe, we have um, a lot of activity in Horizon 2020 projects. There's about three currently, and it's growing all the time. The, the, the stakeholder network is above 7,000 people. In the history of ILSA Europe, in the 31 years it's, it's existed, there have been 428 publications, 22,500 citations. And if ILSA Europe were an individual researcher, that researcher would have a Hirsch index of 80, which is a measure of impact. There are currently 20 task forces with 45 expert groups, and we're currently undergoing um, proposal reviews for four additional activities. And the portfolio is organized around six clusters of activities. Um, in addition, there are 500 industry and academic scientists in our expert groups. Um, to, to, to construct that network from scratch would be a huge project, but the value is, is the pool of expertise that the branch can call upon. So this would be my, one of my messages to the ILSI South Africa branch is that conserve your network very carefully because the network is important and, and that's how you, you leverage uh, expertise for, for the benefit of everybody. In 2017 there are 58 member companies and 19 staff. Again, not a, not a, not a huge number of staff but ILSI Europe along with ILSI North America would be the biggest branches in, in the network. What amazes me about ILSI South Africa is what I can do with so few people. And uh, it's, it's down to the, I think, the volunteers and uh, Lucia is a, is a major driver as well, I'm sure. Um, so again, more, more about the network. So it's um, it, over 500 people in, in total, but of those, 240 are non-industry experts from 21 countries. Um, and in addition to that network in Europe, of course, we've got access to a, another 700 experts through the European projects, the Horizon 2020 projects we're involved in. So again, lots of ways of, of um, uh, leveraging networks. So a few slides about the current um, port portfolio of activities. So it's divided into, largely <coughs> into food safety and nutrition. So if we look at, maybe I can I use a pointer? I can. 
Um, so one, one of them, of course, is the area of viruses and food. Um, a large number of the outbreaks of foodborne illness are caused by viruses, um, notably norovirus, for example. And we have not a very well-developed science when it comes to the control and management of viruses in foods. So a lot of research is needed there, especially in relation to defining what the appropriate and effective control measures are. Um, looking at novel foods and uh, exploring uh, apps and barcode readers um, to see how we can actually um, better undertake dietary intake assessments. The, the topic of animal testing, of course, is something that we all want to manage and avoid unnecessary animal testing. So how can we define alternatives that will actually ensure food is just as safe um, for human consumption? Then there's a the whole issue of allergens. At the SAFOS meeting yesterday, we had some many discussions about uh, precautionary allergen labeling. And of course, we're, we're, we're moving into the, the whole way of thinking now that we have in vital which is looking at threshold doses and trying to define a, a cutoff, a, re a reasonable cutoff for allergen management instead of saying may contain all the time. Um, the threshold of toxicological concern has now been around a long time. ILSI made a major contribution to the application of the TTC for the evalu for the, um, in, in the area of food safety and that's been extended to genotoxic carcinogens, and it's currently being, being uh, reassessed for that purpose. The area of high throughput toxicity testing, uh, you know, the whole area of what HESI calls risk 21 uh, and tox 21, how can we apply new tools to become even more precise about our chemical risk assessments in food? In the area of micro, the next tool, of course, is next generation sequencing, whole genome sequencing and metagenomics to better characterize the microbiological safety of foods. And now, the, the challenge there, of course, is that the technology is evolving faster than we can keep up in our ability to interpret the data. So again, a great place for ILSI to be because we need a rapid response to this because it's going to be applied increasingly. If you look at the United States, FDA have already sequenced at least 50 or 60,000 isolates in, um, from factory environments. So again, the tool is in use. So let's get to work defining how it can be applied and interpreted. And then the whole area of mycotoxins, of course. Uh, the mycotoxin menace, for want of a better word, hasn't gone away. Um, it affects at least 500 million people worldwide. And again, it keeps coming back. So what measures can we use to mitigate uh, mycotoxins? Then in nutrition, um, the whole area of choice architecture is a big topic at the moment. Uh, you've heard about the nudge, and excuse me, can we nudge people to making better choices, healthier choices? That's a huge opportunity. The area of the microbiota, I'm, I'm talking specifically now of the gut microbiota, the gut microbiome, and especially in the first 1,000 days of life, can have determinative effects on health later in life. So again, getting a better consensus and understanding on that because there are many points of view currently. Um, again, alternatives for animal testing. Animal testing crosses over from safety into nutrition models. Um, the area of prebiotics as opposed to probiotics and gut microbiota. The brain. You know, one of the big, big topics at the moment is the infocognobio nexus, to speak of another nexus. And the aging brain, of course, is an area of active research at the moment. Can we, again, find consensus there? Uh, the probiotic area, still going strong. Low-grade inflammation, chronic inflammation. Inflammation is at the heart of many chronic diseases. And of course, managing inflammation is something that we can uh, make a contribution to in the context of diet and nutrition. And then markers of insulin sensitivity and secretion for early detection of diabetes risk. Rather than looking at the, the late markers, can we, can we move up in the disease process 
and propose early markers of pre-disease condition. And then leaving ILSI Europe, then this is our membership list for 2017. So 58 members, um, all very active. So I'm going to now take you into some thoughts about the, uh, the topic of the presentation, the, the food, nutrition, environment, nexus. And I, I want to share this slide with you, which is my representation of perhaps some of the challenges facing <coughs> us in, in the world of food today. We start with our goal, which of course is consumer health, trust and confidence. That's why we're here. That's what our companies and our products depend upon most of all. What are the factors then imp impacting upon that? Well, the social and cultural environment is, is shifting radically. Um, I was surprised when I started building these slides some time back that we, we were actually seeing more foodborne disease, not less. And, and let me say that, first of all, Food is safer than it's ever been. Uh, remember that we doubled life expectancy in 100 years. So we're living longer <laughs> than we ever did. Life expectancy, even for the less healthy, is also longer. A Down syndrome child in 1980 lived for 25 years, life expectancy. Down syndrome child today lives for 56 on average. So we've made huge advances. However, there are still some things happening that means our job, our work, is not finished. Foodborne disease, well, there are factors around that. We, our monitoring is better, so our, our surveillance is improving. And also, you've got more vulnerable and susceptible people, so people uh, who are what used to be called yuppies, young, old, pregnant, immunocompromised. So that, that means that you know, they're more susceptible to foodborne disease. There, there is a lot of distrust of food, and there is a lot of distrust of food manufacturers currently, which again is something to be addressed. And that can only take place over a, a, a period of time and a period of doing the right thing, doing the right thing the right way. Um, consumer expectations are changing radically. Just look in a store now, you've got all the free from products, free from gluten, free from lactose, free from wheat, etc., etc. And some are genuinely driven by uh, intolerances and, and sensitivities. Some are driven more by perception. And consumption patterns, of course, are changing as a consequence. And we, we know little at this point in time what the consequences of that changing food landscape will have on long-term nutrition and health. The media and the social media, we've moved from trust in institutions, institutional trust, to trust to something which, which could be called social trust. People are referencing their social environment more for information <coughs> than the institutions that used to advise them before. The institutions being the governments, the academies, the companies. NGOs are very active, often on single topics, one topic at a time. Um, they can be forces for good, and they can also sometimes get it wrong. Crowdfunding, crowdsourcing. So this is a, something we saw increasingly where you know, somebody can get an analytical research project done by, by going to the internet and saying, please fund my, my, uh, my analysis, with, with consequences that are not all, always easy predictable. And the new, the new field of food ethics, um, what's acceptable, not acceptable, is changing all the time. Then on the business side, um, there, there is an increasing number of food recalls, uh, certainly in the US and some other parts of the world as well. And I read one place that there's up to, one, up to a six going on any one time in the US. Now, the question you have to ask yourself, is that sustainable? I don't think it is from a business point of view. So we've got to, we've got to cut back on recalls. We've got to get to a point where we're preventing the problems, not reacting to them. Uh, if you look at the World Economic Forum Global Risk Report, which is published every year, they predict that there may be more food and water crisis in the world <coughs> in the future. A gloomy picture. Um, food fraud is a big deal. It's up to a 50 billion US dollar industry worldwide every year. That was the, the topic I spoke about yesterday at Safos. So, so food fraud is global. 
And again, because of the complexity of trade and the complexity of consumer demands in the food environment, that's likely to increase as well uh, before we get, uh, we, we get that under control. There's the complexity of doing business. And then the costs are increasing. So margins shrinking and costs are increasing. Also, the costs of getting things wrong are, are going through the roof. Remember, melamine cost 18 billion US dollars, the melamine contamination in China. Um, other big incidents, WPC 80 in New Zealand, um, this was again hundreds of millions. Um, some of the big US recalls were in the hundreds of millions. So it's very easy now to be in the hundreds of millions when you've got a safety problem or a recall. Moving to science and technology, so we are seeing unprecedented advances in sciences, especially around tools like whole genome sequencing, uh, big data analytics, um, agri-food technology, the use of um, precision agriculture, the use of drones in agriculture, these are good things. Uh, but, but also, you've got on the other hand, a new science telling you things that you didn't know before, a classic example was the revelation that artif some artificial colors could potentially cause hyperactivity in children. This was the so-called Southampton study in the UK. So again, it changes, it changes, you have to change your thinking when you get data like that. And then analytical technology, which will easily take you down to parts per trillion uh, for contaminants. You suddenly see something that you didn't know was there. You've got to, you challenge your risk assessments to tell you what does it mean. Um, in the area of environment, we've heard much about that at the, at the SAFOS meeting. 70% uh, of fresh water in the world is used for agriculture and dwindling. So is that sustainable? Probably not. So we've got to use water more wisely. The Western Cape is currently suffering from a, a, a water challenge, uh, as well as many other parts of the world. Some rivers no longer make it to the sea. The Colorado River, for example, rarely makes it to the sea now because of diversion for human use. Um, we've got climate. So climate change, people think, think of it as 2050 and beyond. Well, the impacts on crop yields are already happening. And the, the consensus, I think, is that we will see impacts on some crop yields already on average, worldwide, it will decrease crop yields, but some regions of the world will actually see increased crop yields. So there'll be winners and losers. Um, and un unfortunately, uh, the winners probably already are well off. They don't need extra yields, and those who need extra yields will, may, may actually see the opposite. Um, we, we're seeing dwindling bioresources. 40% of the land of the world is dedicated to agriculture. Again, questioning whether that's sustainable. According to the FAO, 30% of the soil in the world is degraded currently significantly. And the predictions are that unless something's done about soil integrity, all of the soil in the world could be significantly degraded by 2050. And soil, without soil, you don't grow anything. Well, you, you could. You could go to hydroponics and other, other systems. However, soil is a big deal. And we forgot about soil. We just thought, well, we can keep, we can keep pumping nitrogen into it and keep, and keep ex exploiting it. Well, unfortunately, it isn't that simple. Remember as well, you know, we're, we're, we're here because of remarkable inventions like the Haber-Bosch process, and the, the synthetic chemical nitrogen fixation. 40% of our bodies is currently nitrogen. 40% of the nitrogen in our bodies is synthetic, artificially fixed nitrogen. It's not fixed by bacteria in the soil, in plants. It's fixed by a chemical process in a factory. That's how much synthetic nitrogen we're using. So the whole of our agriculture system is predicated upon the use of fossil fuels to manufacture synthetic nitrogen fertilizers. And that, again, I'm sure there's a way of optimizing that. And then we got, we got environmental contamination, of course. 
Um, on the regulatory side, many of you are concerned with the regulations, and of course a challenge, you know, what every company that works internationally would like is a harmonized system, you know, similar regulations in, in every country. Um, that's the dream. Um, we have increasing regulatory complexity. Different countries do different things, and sometimes it's difficult to explain to consumers because they're not always aligned, and they're not always simple to explain. You've got increased product monitoring. So, and this is not a bad thing, of course. Um, it's necessary, I think, to ensure, again, consumer confidence. But there's more product testing. And I think one of the other points that comes across a lot is that among the international regulatory community, there's limited understanding of complex food systems. So one of my messages today is that we should be looking at food in the, in the context of systems. We look at food systems and we do systems analysis of that because if you don't understand the system, it's very hard to do anything about it. Now, moving rapidly ahead then, moving towards solutions, you've, you've heard of the sustainable development goals and at the heart of the sustainable of the SDGs is the fact that 10 of these actually have a food and water connection. Um, and, and, and these strategic or sustainable development goals are not disconnected. They're, they're, they're very much connected up. And, and so, for example, if, if our goal is to encourage more fish consumption for health reasons, how, how would you deliver that? What if everybody started eating fish? Could the world cope? And probably not. Um, so, the, the challenge here is that to cater with the, 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 the nine billion people that will live on the planet in 2050, we need to make one third more food available. Doesn't mean we need to grow one third more food. Remember that we have a huge issue with food waste, which is coming up in, a, in, a, in one of my slides. But you know, we need to start to connect up. This is the reason that I use the word nexus here, that we need to connect up the different parts of this complex jigsaw. A few statistics then. Well, one of the sad realities is that today malnutrition is still the cause of 35% of the disease burden in children under five years, leading to three to five million uh, deaths per year. And remember, I, I'll quote Barker, the Barker hypothesis, epigenetics. If you expose a child to suboptimal nutrition, that critical window of development, you change the epigenome of that individual so that their susceptibility to disease later in life is altered. This is an important deal. It's not just one part of their life, it potentially can be enti the entire life. <coughs> um, obesity, of course, is a major topic. Today, one out of three is overweight or obese. That's 120 million in the US and 20% of people under 18 in China alone. Allergy is a big topic, and allergy, of course, now I'm, I'm, I'm including in this skin, food, respiratory allergies, all types of allergy, if affects one in four people. And it's forecast to increase. And again, food can actually do something about that, directly and indirectly. And then finally, in this sequence, looking to 2050, one in five people will be over the age of 65 in 2050. So huge burden coming on the health systems of the world, which will have to be addressed. Can health alone, <coughs> healthcare alone pay? Probably not. We will need to work more on prevention and maintaining healthy life years. And food has, a, a, of course, a big role to play in that. So some vital statistics building on those slides. Um, just to let you know that as of, I think it was 2015, there are now more urban dwellers in the world than rural population. <coughs> And the urban dwellers will increase, I think, to something like 70% of the world's population by 2050. So how do you move the food to them? How do you provide nutrition? How do you provide water? And so on. So it changes the game of food quite a lot. Another maybe quite shocking statistic is that mortality due to non-communicable diseases is now greater than that from infectious diseases. According to the WHO, the diet-related risks are now greater than those from tobacco, unsafe sex, and drugs combined. Um, 
another interesting statistic that I, I was quite surprised by is that the number of obese people in the world is, is vastly greater now than the number of underweight. And this changed in a, in a short period of time, something like 20, 20 to 40 years, you went from a, double the number of underweight to, to quite the opposite. 800 million people in the world are undernourished, and 2 billion suffer from a micronutrient deficiency, the so-called hidden <coughs> hunger. So the hidden <coughs> hunger affects one third of the world population. And then on the micronutrient side, 5.2 million cases of preventable blindness due to vitamin A deficiency in 2011, 157,000 deaths attributable to vitamin A deficiency. 82% of children under two years are anemic. I'm talking globally now. Two billion at risk of, of, of zinc deficiency, and, and, and what I didn't know was that 450,000 deaths a year uh, are attributable to zinc deficiency. These are simple, preventable conditions. Um, on obesity, uh, if you want to read up on it, there's an interesting paper in The Lancet, again going into the details of this and doing some projections. Um, if food trends continue, the, the likelihood of meeting the global obesity target is, is quite low and probably, in, in the words of the author, <coughs> impossible. In fact, they're predicting that obesity prevalence will reach 18%. That's obesity now, not overweight. Um, the global increase of BMI has not slowed down, but it has in some parts and, and, and has increased in others. So this is the, the thing, you've got this difference between different parts of the world. And, and the other in interesting conclusion of that report was that high BMI alone will signify different risks for different parts of the world because the access to healthcare and pharmacotherapy differs so that having high BMI in one country, one region, may not actually carry the same risk as having a high BMI in another part of the world. A few words on the Anthropocene. So it's official. We live in, in this, this new era. And what makes me somewhat upset is that in, in my lifetime, I, I read Rachel Carson's Silent Spring when I was growing up and all the other literature around it. And a lot of the predictions were gloomy and they never came to pass, so I thought, fine, great. But then you start reading what's happened in the past 20 to 40 years. And one, one example of how dramatic the changes have been is the Great Barrier Reef. Half of the Great Barrier Reef has actually been destroyed since 1980. It's not a long time ago, so these are quite dramatic changes. We've possibly done more damage to the planet in the past 40 to 50 years than has ever been done before. Food waste, um, if we cut food waste in the world, it would cut the food gap, gap that we're going to have in 2050 by at least 20%, maybe 30%. But it is a reality that one third of food is wasted currently. Waste means in the hands of the consumer after, after production. So it's during production and, and during manufacture and consumption. Um, that doesn't include what we would call food loss. So food losses refer to the, the pre-manufacturing step. So that would be in the, in the agriculture phase. So a lot of food is lost today and wasted. That can be prevented. It means 24% of calories are wasted, um, are 1.3 billion tons, with a value of $1 trillion worldwide per year. Um, the Sustainable Development Goals have set a target for 50% reduction in food waste. And one other dramatic, of course, effect is the fact that 30% of greenhouse gas emissions are attributable to agricultural activities. 10 to 15% of annual greenhouse gas emissions are attributable to deforestation. And deforestation, remember, is also taking place because of feed and food. Um, so we're going to have to get on top of this issue of the increase in animal product consumption, because that's also an unsustainable reality. 80% projected increase in consumption of animal products by 2050. Do we have the land to grow the feed and the water to uh, feed those animals? Good question. In beef alone, the projected increase is, is 90%, um, which, of course, will, will drive the, the whole consumption of animal protection products, because if you have that many animals, uh, you, need to, you need to use more 
antibiotics. It's projected that antibiotic use will increase by two by two thirds between now and 2030. More if we grow more pigs. So I'm gonna. How much time have I got, uh, Simon? I'm okay on time. Yeah. So some some ways forward. We need to change consumption patterns, and we need to reduce waste. And some of it is simple habits. You know, I, I I've become aware since arriving in South Africa of not letting the tap run. Where I come from, we, we've got a lot of water, so you don't think about letting the tap run. Here you have to change your habits, so you need to educate people to, to start exercising good habits when it comes to food. Recycling is important. So the circular economy, making sure that we're not wasting <coughs> materials that we, we could recycle. A good example there would be waste products used to produce insects, which could be then used as food or feed. Uh, you can now use insects in Europe for the feeding of fish, of uh, fish farms. Why not? That's what fish eat. Um, poultry eat insects all the time. So there are, there are ways of making the food into more food, which can then be conserved for, for use in the, in the food chain. Precision agriculture, where you, you know, on a meter-by-meter -meter basis, you apply the right level of fertilizer, the right level of water. Water harvesting for example, from, from rain or from other sources. Ocean farming as opposed to aquaculture, which would be near the shore, but deep oceans. Uh, polyculture, where you're growing a potentially a, a fish and a, a seafood and plants potentially into one integrated agricultural system. And then ur urban farming, vertical farming. Uh, the advent of the LED, the, the light emitting uh, diode, um, has facilitated indoor farms in many cities of the world where you're able to grow these, these vertical um, racks <coughs> where you can grow lettuce and, and other, other materials. I'm going to zip through the sciences slides because I'm, I, I want to spend my, my time on the, the, the last concluding slide, but just, just to let you know that we've, we've got an explosion of the data sciences. We're, we're moving into what's called fourth paradigm science. This is data-driven science. And, and part of the problem with this is that we now have more information and data than we know what to do with, which is becoming a bit of a problem. And I won't go through the slide, but you know, some of the takeaway messages on this is that the explosion of papers, five scientific publications a minute, means that nobody's got time to keep up anymore. And, and so you know, we're, we're reading less than we used to. And, the danger is that mistakes get made because of that. Um, so we're in the ad e era of big data, uh, which I think will revolutionize food and nutrition. We'll have more data in real time. And, and some of the data will be in the hands of consumers via smartphone apps. There was a, a conference on the, on the smartphone analytical um, opportunities in, con in Holland in the early part of the year. You know, every consumer potentially and every scientist can have in a smartphone an analytical instrument. Analytical in the sense that you, plug, you can plug it into a sensor and it'll, it'll, it'll tell you something about your, your food or yourself. Or you can do the analysis for you. So huge opportunities there. But more data does not n equal more know-how. And uh, just to quote you know, Einstein, data is not information, information is not knowledge, and knowledge is not action. So this is the, 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 the key takeaway there. Um, in fact, having more data can lead to more confusion. Um, as, as Spencer said, if a man's knowledge is not in order, the more of it he has, the greater will be his confusion. So let's get our, our knowledge in order in the area of food, food safety and nutrition. Um, I am a big fan of citizen science. You know, and, I, and I think, again, this is my, my, my point about the smartphones. Um, after Fukushima, the Fukushima disaster in Japan, where the tsunami um, you know, poured over the wall of the Fukushima nuclear plant, and you had you had a meltdown and, and release of radionuclides. Uh, a, a group was set up called Safecast, and now they're working worldwide. But Safecast was citizens that that got radiometers and took radiation readings and then fed them into a central database. So this is becoming again more common. Um, GitHub is a way of sponsoring that, and GitHub as well. They provide the pieces that are cheap. Anybody can be a scientist if you have the, the, the will and the spirit to 
play your role in generating data and then pool the data and see what you can actually do with that on a global scale. For the smartphone, the smartphone is a bona fide research instrument. You can buy a research kit for Apple um, uh, products and research stack for Androids. And, and these are um, basically kits that enable people to task the phone with research um, purposes. And one, one good example of that is that for Parkinson's researchers, you've got iTrim and Empower. And these are, use the ergonometer built into the phone to measure the tremor in a patient. So again, simple built-in er er ergonometer, uh, you can measure the tremor. Uh, independently, in the home, cheaply, in real time, and, and more frequently than would be possible in a doctor's uh, clinic. So I'm, I'm going to jump very through the societal changes, and I'm, I'm, I've, I'm coming close to the end now, but um, I think one of the, the problems we have in the societal context is that consumers are more than ever uh, conceptually removed from food systems. They don't know where the food is coming from. Uh, and, and so we need to do some work there to improve the understanding and explain in a transparent way. And transparency will generate more trust to the, to the next point in terms of building a, a better relationship with food. Um, and we, we shouldn't dismiss consumers' fears. It's very easy to be meritocratic and say, well, we know best. Well, there's a rational basis for many of the consumer fears. So, you know, um, I, I often think of Stephen Covey, the, the, the famous American management guru, and he, he, he made the point that we, we often uh, listen with the intention of responding rather than listening with the intention of understanding. So we need to understand the consumer, I think, here as well, and what's driving the fears. More information is not necessarily the answer, and often as scientists, that's what we do. We, we give more information, and, and things don't necessarily change. So a different form of engagement is needed. Uh, and building on food ethics principles and increased quality of food information, increased transparency, and importantly, increased trans, um, cooperation across the, the different stakeholders. So moving to the last slide, I want to leave you with these messages. I think the way forward, as I said earlier, is a, a systems report approach to food, you know, including defined accountabilities. Who owns the food chain? Who, who do you call? Well, you're going to have to define who are the people, the actors, that would have accountabilities and, and who would have to work together. And, and that must be applied to food and nutrition to ensure sustainable progress. Um, we need, again, to understand and remember that food chains are not disconnected from the environment. They're part of the environment. So you've got to look at the environmental impact of food chains as well. And there is necessarily a shift in focus from the quantity to the quality of calories now. Quantity is easy. Quality is more challenging. What would a sustainable diet and lifestyle look like? How, what, what, how would you operationalize that? How, how would you translate what would be defined scientifically as a sustainable diet and lifestyle, and then how would you build your operational plan around that? Better alignment of dietary policies and food policies, because they're not always well connected or well aligned. They're built, often they're built separately, but they're, but they're related, again, part of the food system. And a, a new science of food is possible that delivers a radically different experience for consumers. So we can do all of that and respond to consumer expectations as well. Uh, I mentioned food choice architecture, and I think this, this is really exciting, that you, you, you use the, 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 the tools of behavioral psychology, including nudge, nudging, to get people to making the right choices for themselves as well. Uh, how to improve affordability of healthy diets. And reduction of food waste supported by food safety standards. Can, how can you do that? Well, for, for instance, much food is discounted because people believe it to be expired or, or no longer safe. It's past its best before date. Well, it may still be perfectly safe. So we need, again, to address the unintentional effects of some of the regulations we have and some of the standards we have when it comes to food waste. And then the final point is that it's all about one thing. It's all about relationships. And this, this is why it's so important at an ILSI meeting to leave this message. It's about relationships between data, systems, people, 
businesses and consumers. Thank you very much.